Secretariat, a winner again. His winning time in the 1973 Preakness has been chained to a stakes record 153. Secretariat now owns a record winning time in all three legs of the Triple Crown. Please go. Good. Tuesday, I went and looked at the rerun of his 
first four races, and it justified what my thought was uh, that he was just plain timid. Because he had run three quarters, three quarters of a mile in 110, which was unheard of uh, for a two-year-old, and I never let him let him run. You know, I mean, he just fought me all the way. So he gave me. Well, at first he didn't want to give me the three, uh, the uh, the money to work with him. So then finally he said, "Okay." I said, "Either you want to stay horse or you want a climber." She horse. So he, I then he sent me out to work some other horses. So I went out and worked two horses, and then told the foreman, "says Tell Ronnie I want to see him." So he called me in the, in the office and he says, uh, okay, I'll give you a money. So I said, all right. I said, I want the best exercise boy we have, which was Charlie Davis. And then I said, I'll take Tom. He listens to me a lot, a young kid. So I uh, played with him for uh, a month. And he asked me, he said, what do you think? I said, I think you're ready. I said, he needs a really good work now. I said, I want the best horse in the barn. Well, the best horse in the barn was a four-year-old steak horse. He said, are you crazy? He said, you're trying to kill him? I said, no. I said, I'm not going to hurt him. I said, if he, you know, if he can't catch him, why do you want to catch him? And I said, I need four feet off the rail. I told him the reason first, before I started with him, is that he was just timid. And I had to teach him to be bounced around a little bit. And, and I worked him uh, that three quarters of a mile. I, I asked him to break the other horse, the best horse in front, which was the best horse you had in the barn. And I said, give me four feet of the rail. And I flew right through that hole. And no timidity at all. I mean, he just, he was ball, he just went through. And we went the rest of the year undefeated, and we went all the way, won the triple crown, I mean, excuse me, the Derby, the Bluegrass of Derby, the race of Florida, Bluegrass Derby. And then <coughs> uh, he ran the mud at uh, Laurel, which he didn't like. I knew he didn't like mud anyway. And then he came back and won the Belmont, and then flew to California and won the uh, Hollywood Derby. So that's the kind of horse he turned out to be. And he saved the farm for the Meadow Stable. He wanted a two-year-old champion with a horse that won the most races that year. I should be the most uh, money that year. So a, a jockey does more than ride the horse? Pardon? A jockey does a lot more than just ride the, the horse. Uh, definitely. The, the jockey does a lot of the training himself. I mean, he does a lot. He, he's the one doing the, the riding. He's the one handling the horse. Therefore, he's actually the, the trainer. Uh, the trainer himself, he's more or less the manager. He tells you what to do or asks you what you think. And then he goes and put him in the entries. He chooses a race to run, run him in. So, that's his job, but uh, the jockey and the other side boy are the one handling the horse. Any other question? Yeah, you know, the commentary suggested that uh, we haven't had a triple crown winner in all of those years, primarily because the horses are less fragile or more fragile now than they were. With all the selective breeding, why is it that the horses are becoming more fragile? Because we don't have the horsemen we used to have. I don't think they work as much together as we used to to, to do, and uh, I believe the drug has a lot to do with it. Drugging horses, I think, does it, it not make him strong for a race, but eventually it just make him weak, and then they get they get steroid, they get they get too heavy for the the size of their bones, therefore they break down. They did feed him oats and hay, and, uh, hay like we used to. I think that uh, we have better horses. Another question? 
I enjoyed the Triple Crown aspect of the discussion as well in the film. And uh, I was wondering what characteristics horses need, in your opinion, to win the Triple Crown, and whether or not racing fans should expect that to happen any time in the next 20 or 30 years. Oh, I expect to see, uh, I don't myself, I, if I'll see a Triple Crown winner, but I, I expect a Triple Crown winner to come. And, uh, but like I said, they'll have to change their style. They'll have to do away with drugs. And uh, uh, that's about it. I mean, it, there, there's definitely horses there that are strong enough to win a, win a race. Uh, they have to train them constantly. Uh, the same manner that they show the most, uh, uh, the biggest race that they run. And you need to school them from the time he's a baby to run uh, on the lead, run in the middle of the pack, run and run, come from behind. So a horse has to be taught, they're just babies when we start with them. So they're going to be what we teach them. Questions? Uh, yes? I read something about a <laughs> long time ago about uh, good jockeys starting out when they're 12, 13, 14 years old. And you were supposed to start out, you were much older than that. So how come? What happened? Well, maybe I was more mature. <laughs> <laughs> now, I learned from uh, my dad around horses. I learned from the bottom up the same as they do when they start, but they don't start that young, though. they start 16, 17. I don't think you're allowed, much allowed to, to work before you're 17. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, riding races and that. But uh, a lot of time, riders go bad because they start making big money and they're too, they're not mature enough to know how to handle it, and they fall into bad company, with bad company, fall into drugs, drink, and stuff, so on. And they don't know what it is for a dollar. So I think if people, the young riders, or anybody, that start working early, they know what it is for a dollar, and they'll probably learn how to stash it away. Couple more questions. That'll be one. Uh, I've done a lot of sports and and team sports and individual sports. But when do you know that you and your horse are in sync? Is it at the gate? Is it when you go in the morning? How does he feel? You must know by looking at your horse how he feels, how he is today. Is he going to run or is he just going to be nah, not my day? Well, his workouts will indicate how he goes, and the next, uh, that evening, how, uh, how he eats, he eats good, clean up his, his, uh, his feed tub, uh, the next morning he's still feeling, feeling good, and we'll walk him that morning, and the following day, if he's still cleaning up and uh, feeling good again, then you know what you got. You know, when's your, when's your biggest rush? Is it when the bell sounds, or when you cross the gate, or when you pass the, the last horse, or where's your biggest trail? Well, actually, when you want to draw the Y in front. <laughs> but uh, in the case of Secretariat, he was actually running, still running at 40 miles an hour when he crossed the wire after run, having run a mile and a quarter. It, it is unusual that a, run, a horse run that fast after running a mile and a quarter, but he was an unusual horse. Yeah. yeah. One, uh, two more questions, yeah. that's it? <laughs> okay. I have a quick one. Um, Mr. Turgot, I'm a big fan. And uh, I have a question. In the Belmont, when you and Sham took off, obviously Sham finished last in that race, was there any uh, threat that Secretary couldn't hold that pace? Was there any what? Like, was there, were you worried that he couldn't hold that pace? The pace of no. going so fast? Because so, in the movie, all they talk about, the announce, and even in the ESPN film, they're like, no one could believe. They thought it would burn out. 
You're right about that, but they were they weren't on the horses when when you prepared. Sure. When I prepared them uh, for the race, I was working them quite fast, and he was taking it good. And when he was coming back good after his work, uh, you know, I was trying to uh, keep him there. If he was going to back up, back off that and, and work, it was too much. Then I would back off. But if he thrived on it, I would just continue on until I reached his peak. So that's, uh, I was, uh, he, he was a horse that was still, you know, fresh, like he was uh, reaching his peak. Okay, thank you. Okay, two more final questions. I see Jamie wants to ask a question, the gentleman sure. next to you. Um, uh, Ron, you're one of our uh, New Brunswick Sports Hall of Fame uh, sports ambassadors going into schools and talking to children about your experiences in sport. Uh, when you go in and talk to the children, are, are you um, uh, pleasantly pleased with how much, how much of uh, understanding the children in our school systems now have about your story and about your involvement in sport? Yes, with the invention of the uh, uh, computer, uh, and the kids learn a computer in school and all that. They can go in, research uh, my career, uh, the horse's career. So they know much more than, uh, let's say, that I would have known back then because I didn't even know the race. there was any racing, uh, you know, everyday racing. So the uh, kids are very, uh, uh, very much up to date on uh, most athletes and, uh, they, they check it on YouTube and all that, so they, they know pretty well what's going on and what I have performed or my horses perform in their life. Thank you. And the last question? Thank you. Uh, Ron, every time I see the Triple Crown, I get excited and, and I wondered, I guess, whether or not you still do, but secondly, every time I see your accident, I just cringe and I wonder if you still do. Like, how do you react to those two things? Ah, uh, you don't get goose pimples when you see them run? <laughs> <laughs> I do get goose pimples still. Uh, the accident, I just took it as another day and, uh, at work and uh, took it one day at a time. There's nothing I could do about it. It's an accident that happened. I could have uh, crossed the street and got hit by a car. And uh, it's, I call it an accident. Okay, I would like to say thank you very much, Ron. You are an inspiration, and not just to New Brunswickers and to Canadians, but I really uh, I'm very much uh, want to say thank you to you for the work that you do on behalf of the disabled community, because I know that they look up to you as a leader, and you were recently uh, given uh, inducted into the, into the New Brunswick um, uh, Lieutenant, you were given the Order of New Brunswick for your work with the disabled community. So that is something, I mean, how many people of Ron's stature do we have uh, speaking on behalf of the disabled who, who can get, I mean, his, his stature is so great that when he says something, I'm sure people listen. And I know what you've done yourself, you're an amazing example, not only for New Brunswickers, but for children and for us here, it's inspiring to have you here. It's just wonderful. Now, sp speaking of which, uh, I know there's a little boy here who wants to have his picture taken with you.